Welcome to the Life Worship Center broadcast, 1604 Golden Springs Road. For more information about our church, visit us on the web at lifewc.org. And now, today's sermon. Praise the Lord. Come on, give them a good praise. Give them a big praise today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How great our God is. How great. How great is our God. Thank you, Jesus. Look at your neighbor. Just say, my God is great. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the encouragement. God, you can encourage when we need it the most. You just have a way of lifting us up. You just have a way of giving hope to the hopeless. You just have a way of opening our eyes to see you. We just thank you for that, God. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, praise team. I want to share with you out of the book of Joshua this morning. I have a word stirring in my heart. I've titled this message, My Mountain, My Mountain. We're in Joshua chapter 14, and I'm going to start in verse 6. How many remember, um, was it Paul Harvey that used to have the rest of the story? Y'all remember that? And he would, some of you do, some of you don't. It's weird now, I'm one of those that do. <laughs> when I say it used to be, I wouldn't be the one to remember. But I do remember. And he, he talked about popular stories, but he, he, he told you parts of it that maybe you didn't know or didn't remember or never thought of. And today I want to give you sort of the, the rest of the story. Most of you if, you, if you've spent any time in church, if you've heard any number of sermons and uh, you went to church as a kid even, but you probably remember the story of the 12 spies that went out to spy out the land. Raise your hand if you remember the story of the 12 spies that went out to spy the land for, for God's people, the promised land. And so today, we're just going to talk about the rest of that story, because there's something really good that comes out of that story. And I believe God wants to encourage you with His Word, and so I, what I want to do first is I want to read... Several scriptures here. I'm going to read verse 6 through verse 15 out of Joshua 14. And so you can follow along with me. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal. And Caleb the son of uh, Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh, somebody say 40 years old, <laughs> from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly follow the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, here I am this day, 85 years old. Somebody say 85 years old. As yet I am as, yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Somebody say praise the Lord for that. 
Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb the son of Jephunneh as an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite to this day. Because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kerjath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. Father bless your word. Your word is blessed. Open up our ears to hear, our hearts to receive this powerful word, God, that you're speaking to us today. God, let faith arise in Jesus' mighty name. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Failure is not my focus. Failure is not my focus. Failure should not be the focus of the people of God. Our focus is faith. It is not fear. It is not failure. Our focus is faith. You know, people ask me a lot of times, many times over the years, do you believe in eternal security? What about once saved, always saved? I've been asked that question. I don't know how many times I've been asked it. And my, I'm not going to answer it for you today. That's not the point of the question. What I want you to hear is this. I believe it's the wrong question for us as God's people to ask. I believe if we're asking questions like that all the time, we're living in doubt. Our focus is on failure. Our focus is not on faith. Every time I get asked that question, it has to do with somebody who, who's not following the Lord, someone who's not walking with God anymore, someone who's turned their back and doing their own thing, and because of that, they have questions. Their loved ones have questions. And I want to tell you today that our God is a gracious God. He's such a gracious God. And He does so much for us than we ever deserve. But here's what I want us to do. We need to turn these questions. We need to turn these questions around. And instead of having fear, and instead of having doubts, and instead of focusing on failure, we need to rise up and have faith in God. We need to choose to live in uh, unity with God instead of contradiction to God. In other words, my life should not be how much contradiction can I have in my life and still know Christ. My life should be how much can I walk in the promises of God if I trust Him, if I take Him at His word. What can I see God do in my life if I believe what He says and walk in it? Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm not trying to condemn you today or make you feel bad about your life. I'm just saying take the focus because as long as your focus is on failure and as long as your focus is on how far can I go, you will never walk in the promises of God. But if you'll turn instead and place your faith in the promises of God and walk in those promises, you will begin to see God's fruitfulness in your life. And you'll begin to do things you could never do before. You'll be able to stand where once you fail. You'll be able to say no to things you never were able to say no to. Why? Because you chose to believe and have faith. This is Caleb. This is Caleb. When it comes to the story of Israel in the wilderness, it is a message of failure and fear. When Caleb was 40 years old, he was sent into the promised land as a spy. He had 11 other guys go with him. They went to see if the land was as good as God had said. They had left Egypt. They had seen miracle. They had seen God's provision. They were on the border of what God said was theirs. And so Moses sent out 12 spies. Caleb was one of those spies when he was 40 years old. The spies came back to report to Moses. All 12 spies agreed that the land was good, that it was every bit as good as God said. But where they had disagreement was, was concerning 
the enemy. Two spies communicated faith. Two spies had focus on faith and the promises of God. But ten spies communicated fear and failure. And three million people went with those ten that communicated fear and failure. So let me tell you this. If you'll start walking in faith instead of fear and failure, you might be surprised to see how many people around you will follow someone who has faith in God. But if you walk in fear and you walk in failure and then you wonder why they won't give their heart to Jesus, they're just following your lead. Three million people. As a result, they wandered in the desert for the next 40 years until they all died. God said everybody over 20 years old is going to die in the wilderness. I'll bring up the next generation and they'll get the promised land. So this generation that saw fear and saw failure and chose not to believe their only purpose for the next 40 years was to take care of the next generation that would receive the promise of God. And they did a good job of that. They might not have meant to, but they did a good job of that. Let's just use our imagination for a moment. Just think of the little 10-year-old boy and he's outside and him and his dad are moving the tent because their home is a tent. And they're moving the tent. And they're trying to set things back up. And the little 10-year-old boy says, Dad, when are we going to have a home? Dad, when are we going to have a vineyard and a garden? Dad, when are we going to have a backyard to play in? And the dad says, well, son, before you were old enough to remember, we were right on the edge of the promised land. And it's a land that God promised. God said we'd live in houses we didn't build. God said we'd have vineyards that we didn't plant. And son, we were right there, right on the verge of it. But son, we saw the enemy. And he was bigger. We looked like little bugs to the enemy, son. And because of that, we did not take it. We were afraid. And right then and there, as that little 10-year-old boy is driving those tent pegs in, he's breathing up that desert sand, he's thinking in his heart, if God ever gives us another chance, I'll go in. If God ever gives me the opportunity, I will take it. Those, those younger people, they saw what it looked like for 40 years to live among a people who did not believe in the Lord. He grew up seeing and living the results of living a life based on fear and failure. And every year he grew up a little bit stronger, a little bit braver, and a little bit more determined. And he'd say in his heart, if God gives us another chance, I'll stand up. I will fight it. Faith. Faith doesn't grow old. Faith doesn't grow old. Joshua chapter 14, verse 10 and 11. Caleb stood there 85 years old. He said, Behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said. These 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses... While Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, here I am this day, 85 years old, and yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so is now my strength for war, both going out and for coming, or coming in. He said, the Lord has kept me. He said, I still have a promise that I haven't received. You'll have to go back and read the rest of the story. What had happened is... As Joshua came up as the new leader, they, the walls of Jericho fell flat. And for about seven years, they were defeating kings. They were defeating the enemy. And it came time, Joshua was getting old. He's about 100 years old. And God said, Joshua, you need to start dividing up the land. So you need to start giving different people different parcels of land. And guess who got up there in the front of the line? 85-year-old Caleb got up there and he said, I've been waiting 45 years for this. 
I'm just as strong. I'm just as brave and courageous. I am ready. See, 45 years is a long time, but faith doesn't grow old. Faith doesn't get tired. Faith just keeps on believing. Faith believes when it can't see. Faith believes when it can't hear. Faith believes when it can't touch or feel or understand. Faith just keeps right on believing. Faith believes eternally. Did you know that? Faith is eternal. Next time somebody asks you to believe in eternal security, I believe in eternal believing. (laughs) I believe in a God that I can have faith in for the rest of my life. In 1 Corinthians 13 and 13, where Paul's talking about the gifts, and he says one day the gifts won't be needed anymore because we'll be standing face to face with our Lord and Savior in heaven, and there won't be no need of the spiritual gifts. But he said there's three things that will remain. Faith, hope, and love. He said we're going to need faith when we're in heaven. It's not that we're going to need it. It's just that we're always going to have it. We're going to look at, we're going to look at Jesus and we're going to say, I, I believe in him. I can trust in him. I got hope in him. You understand what I'm saying? Faith is eternal. So even though he had went 45 years without receiving the promise that he was given, he still believed God. You see, this world might strip you of your possessions. It might strip you of your health. It might strip you of your friends. It might strip you of your family. But this world cannot take away your faith. And if you got faith in God, you're going to be all right. Amen. God is going to take care of you. Somebody would say it's hard to believe in God with everything that's happening in the world. It's hard to believe when everybody around you is cold and indifferent. Or it's hard to believe when you've been hurt by people in the church. Here's an 85-year-old man. For the last 45 years, he's endured living in the middle of a bunch of complainers and doubters and grumblers and rebellious sinners. Now, if that don't sound like church people, I don't know what does. So I could give Caleb a break if he just had lost a little bit of hope. Or if he'd have just said, you know what, I'll just be all right with anything God chooses to give me. But no, uh uh-uh. He had a he had a dream. He had faith. He had hope. He had the word of God. And no matter what everybody around him was saying or doing, he was holding on to it because faith does not grow old. His faith was never based on the majority vote. His faith was never based on what everybody else saw about it. He was willing to stand out in the middle of a crowd. If you go back and read the story, the two spies, Joshua and Caleb, that said, we can take this, they almost got stoned. Moses had to stand in between them to keep the people from stoning them. So Caleb, you see a little bit about his heart. He said, I'd rather be stoned to death believing God then start agreeing with these people that just have doubt and fear. Oh, we need that kind of faith. He had, he had God's word. And he held on to that word. You need to have God's word in your heart. And you need to hold on to it. You've got to hold on to what God says. Because out of everything else you can get a grip on, nothing else is going to hold up. But the Word of God, you can hold on to it. Caleb remembered. He's sitting there, 85-year-old man, but he remembered 40 years prior, 45 years prior. He remembered the day of Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 34, 35, 36. This is just after the vote took place. The people said, we're not going in. God wanted to destroy everybody. Moses said, please don't destroy everybody. God, I don't want to start all over. God said this through Moses. And the Lord heard the sound of your words, and he was angry. God was angry with the people. God gave them a land, a promise, an inheritance. 
And they got up to it. And they were not, they didn't trust God and believe God for it. He said, surely not one of these men of this evil generation shall see that good land of which I swore to give to your fathers. Except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. And to him and his children, I am giving the land on which he walked because he wholly followed the Lord. And Caleb kept that word. If it had been me, I wrote it, wrote it down somewhere. And I'd get it out every day as I'm walking through that desert with those bunch of grumblers and complainers. And I'd read that land, read that word where it said, except for Caleb. Except for Caleb. And every time one of his friends might die in the wilderness, we've lost another one, Caleb. He probably uttered, uttered under his breath, except for Caleb, not me. I'm not going this way. I'm not dying in the wilderness. He turned 50 years old and he was still saying, except for Caleb. And he turned 60 and he's still saying, except for Caleb. He turned 70. Nearly everybody in his peer group, everybody that he knew personally as a friend that were the same age as he was, had just about died off. He's 75 and he's saying, except for for Caleb not me not me God said it would not happen to me he said except for Caleb and he held on to that word we're living in a day when the church needs to be able to say except me everybody else is scared except for me everyone else has given up on God except me everyone else has abandoned the word except for me you got to have that rise up within you you need the word of God I believe as Caleb walked through that sand he might have been looking at sand but in his spiritual eyes he was seeing grass he was seeing vineyards he was seeing his home he was seeing that mountain that God gave to him and he chose to walk in faith we don't like to hear the word fight nobody wants to fight but there's a devil that loves to fight against us. And we don't fight like normal people fight. We don't fight like we're going to read about Caleb and how he fought. We don't fight flesh and blood. We fight against spiritual things. And our fighting happens on our knees. And our fighting happens with praise and with worship and with serving God and believing. Our fight is a fight of faith. It's trusting God. And you're never going to do anything for God. You're never going to see the promises of God sitting on your tush. You're never going to see it that way. You're never going to realize anything that way. There, what, is worth, what is worth trusting God? You may start on your knees. And you may end up on your knees. But you need some resolve. You need some go get it. You need some, you need some get up off my rear and trust God for this. You need to get out of the woe is me and it ain't going to happen for me. And how many people can I tell this bad news to? And you need to take a hold of God's word and say, that's God's word for me. And you say, well, pastor, I got that word six weeks ago. I don't know if it was really God's word. How about be like a Caleb? Caleb got the word 45 years ago. And he was just waiting. Caleb was seeing his friends die off like flies. Caleb was thinking, there ain't going to be nobody but me and the young people. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. You think about it, he didn't have anybody. Well, he didn't have anybody within 20 years of him. Him and Joshua was the only ones left of his generation. But he believed God. He Believed the Lord. You're not going to get stuff that you're not prepared for. If you knew God was coming back next week and you needed to tell all your friends about Jesus and share with them the gospel, how many of you would have to call me up and say, Pastor, tell me how to share with somebody the gospel of Jesus? I have a feeling that probably a few of you 
So you're not going to get what you're not prepared for. You want your family saved. You, you want your household. You want, you want it blessed. You want to receive the promises of God. Yet you do not go into the word. You don't have a word. You don't have a verse. You don't have a scripture that you can hold on to. Everybody else in this generation is dying off. It's just me, the way I think. Everybody else is dying off. Caleb was getting up in the morning. He's hitting the gym. He's running a mile. He's swimming laps. Because he had a mountain to take. And he was going to be ready when it came time. Amen. And when the time came, you know what he said? He said, give me this mountain. <laughs> give me this mountain. Joshua 14 and 12. Now, therefore, give me this mountain. He didn't get in line and say, Joshua, what you got for me? He got in line and he said, Joshua, I got the word of God. Joshua, you was there. Nobody else remembers that day. About was in their diapers. But you were there. You heard when God said that mountain, those mountains of Hebron, over there where Jerusalem's going to be. God said that was mine. And Joshua, I'm 85. Give me that mountain. But this is very interesting. That mountain had not yet been won for the Lord. See, Joshua was 100 years old. And God said, Joshua, y'all aren't done taking all the promised land, but you're getting too old for this. So I want you to start giving up parcels of this property. And when it came for Hebron, when it came for Caleb's mountain, that was some, that was some property that had not been won for the Lord. And so who does it belong to? An 85-year-old Jim. And Caleb knew it. That's why he's been hitting the gym. That's why he stood up there and said, Hey, I'm as fit as I was when God spoke the word. I'm as strong as I was then. I've got every bit of faith and every bit of courage as I've had then. I'm willing to stand against the majority today if I need to. But that mountain's mine because God said it was mine. And he went on to say, you heard in the day, you heard in the day how the Anakim were there. Now the Anakim were giants. It means long necks. It means tall people. That's those people that made them look like grasshoppers. They were so big. Normal people looked like little insects. It was, it was an exaggeration in that sense. But they were big old people that were abnormally large. It is believed that from the Anakim, would come the descendants of the Philistines that would end up bringing us Goliath that David would face many years later. Caleb said, you've heard how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. In other words, I'm not asking for, uh, uh, I'm not asking for Cade's Cove <laughs> with just deer and, and pretty trees and, and pastures. I want this mountain, and I know it's inhabited by giants, and I know that it's got walled cities, but he says, it may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able. I love how he doesn't even, he doesn't even say we. Caleb gave up on we a long time ago. He remembered that day 45 years ago when it was just I. So he says, I will drive them out. If nobody else goes with me, I'll drive them out by myself because I won't be by myself. I've got God's word behind me, and God will not fail me. I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. Hmm. Thank you, Jesus. I got to thinking about this. We, we want the promises of God. But we often are complacent to step into them because there, there is um, 
adversaries in the path. We want easy. We want easy. We want comfort. We want serve me. Wait on me. Give me, give me. Caleb said, I want what God says is mine. And if there's a devil standing in the way, he's just going to have to move. Because I'm not coming in the name of Caleb. I'm coming in the name of the Lord my God. Understand? There are some mountains that are to be removed. And there are some mountains that are to be received. Jesus speaks of a mountain that if you have the faith as of a grain of mustard seed, you can speak to that mountain and say, be cast into the sea, and it will be cast into the sea. Amen? But I'm afraid that sometimes, because of our complacent spirit, we were asking God to cast out mountains. There are supposed to be mountains for us to receive. We're asking God to take away the challenges and to take away the adversities when God is wanting us to take the land with its challenges and with its adversities. And so we wonder if there's an issue with our faith because we're speaking to the mountain and it's not going anywhere. But yet it is a mountain that God has placed there for us to take. You see, the Bible says, and Jesus says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In other words, there is land that God wants us to take. There, the kingdom is to grow, not to withdraw. It is to expand. And so we are not, there are mountains that we are to cast into the sea. But there are other possessions, there are other lands, there are other things that we are to take and claim hold of for the kingdom of God and not to be afraid just because they are heavily guarded and fortified. Caleb did not ask for a blessing without giants. We avoid the difficult things because we see the enemy's stronghold. And we don't want to do what is difficult, what is challenging. Even though that is where you see the true power of God at work. He did not claim an inheritance without a battle. He claimed the inheritance knowing full well that there would be a battle. I want you to hear me. Heaven, eternal life is a free gift of God, paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. You cannot pay for it. It's given to us freely. But listen to me, child of God. There is nothing great in this life, nothing great in this life that you can achieve without great Conflict. Because this world is under the sway of the wicked one. <laughs> this world is under the power and the influence of the enemy, our adversary. So even though our salvation is free, and even though God's preparing a home for us that we do not deserve or did not earn, what we take hold of in this life and the ground we take for, for, take for God and anything great that we're going to achieve is going to come with great price. It's going to come with great passion. It's going to come with great conflict, sometimes great pain. And you can even go out of the Christian world and ask anyone who's ever built a great company or anyone that's done anything significant and they would tell you story after story after story of the adversities that came along the way and how many times they were told no, I believe I read where Thomas Edison who invented the light bulb he figured out how to do it wrong 1,000 times before he figured out how to do it right someone said are you not going to give up you've, you've got it wrong a thousand times no he says I'm making ground I have figured out 1,000 ways not to do it 
And you would find that story over and over and over through anyone who has done anything significant. And it is true in the Christian kingdom, in the kingdom of God, that anything we do that will be great will come with great price, will come with great opposition. It's a good thing we serve a great God because He's able to do it. Amen? He's able. We find in Judges chapter 1, the end of this story. So the Lord was with Judah. Judah is the tribe that Caleb came out of. Caleb led Judah there into those hills, into that mountain country. And they drove out the mountaineers. That's not West Virginia. They drove out the mountaineers. And they gave Hebron to Caleb. As Moses said. There he expelled from there the three sons of Anak. He drove out the giants and the leaders of the giants just as God said I don't have the most thrilling testimony there are so many people who have such a greater testimony than mine but this is something I can tell you that if you can take this book and you find anywhere where God made a promise to these individuals whether it was Abraham, or Moses, or Joshua, or Caleb, or Samuel. You take any of them, and you start reading after that promise was made. And you read it. Don't skip any lines. You keep reading it, and eventually you know what you're going to get to. You're going to get to that passage, and it's going to say, And God did this just as He said. Oh, if you can just take hold of the Word of God today. It might not happen today. It might not happen tomorrow. Lord willing, it won't be 45 years from now. But if it is, if God chooses to wait that long, He'll keep you just the way you need to. He'll keep you full of faith and full of strength and full of energy to receive all that God has for you. David was not the first giant killer. It was an 85-year-old man who refused to let his faith grow old. Isn't it awesome how God works? He takes an 85-year-old man to drive out the giants, and he takes a little 16, 17-year-old boy to slay Goliath. What's God trying to tell you? God just needs somebody to say, I've received God's word and I believe who he is and I'm going to stand on it and see what happens. Get some music ready for me, please. I appreciate that. I'm almost done. Giant blessings. They are guarded by giant <laughs> devils. You need to know this and understand this. I've heard people say, I'm going to have a great ministry. I'm going to do great things for God. You better be ready for a great big fight. I had somebody just the other day, and if I don't get this every week, oh Lord. You know, it's just people that don't know the whole story. But nearly every week, somebody will say to me, You sure are blessed. Got two churches. <laughs> and I don't know if I want to laugh or cry when they say it. They don't know the details, they don't know the whole story. 
So I've had about two hours I could share with them a little bit of it. I am blessed to be a part of what God is doing at Life Worship Center. I am blessed. But you need to understand. And when you pray, you need to understand this. That your pastor and his family are fighting twice as many devils as we were three years ago. Why? Why? Because we got faith enough to believe in the God we serve. And we're not going to be led by fear or failure or doubt. And we're not going to let complainers or grumblers or proud people steer us. We're going to go with what God says. Amen. But because of that, because of that, there's giants that have tried to step in the path and say, you're not going any further with this. You're not taking this any further. You know what that does to me? That causes something to rise up within me. It's not me. It has nothing to do with me. If it was just me, I'd say, you're right. I'm stopping. But there's something that rises up within me. And it's the power of, the, of God. It's His Holy Spirit. It's faith bubbling up within me saying, I got a word from the Lord. <laughs> and it doesn't matter who stands in the path. It doesn't matter what giants may rise up and say. It doesn't matter. Anybody with common sense and any kind of knowledge of the Word of God would know that if you step into something where God has ordained that it be blessed, where God has ordained and given visions and given dreams. God's given visions over this place for years before we ever got here. It's got very little to do with us. You need to understand this. This is God's plan. This is God's deal. This is not some person, some man, or some church name, or even some denomination. This is a God thing. And when God says, I'm going to do this, and somebody says, I've got faith enough to believe you, devils will rise up and opposition will come in to try to stop. But what I want to know, is there anybody else here that would agree with me and say, it's not going mean, to it's not gonna persuade me to stop. I will not be discouraged by the liar. I will not, I, I've got God's word in my heart. And I'm willing to stand on the word of God. If he wasn't fighting against us, I'd be worried right now. But we're taking this mountain for an inheritance. Peter said this about an inheritance in 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm almost done. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. I have an inheritance, and you have an inheritance reserved in heaven, and it is every bit as good as God says it is. But the devil ain't about to let us skip through this life right up to our inheritance. He's going to try to stop me. He's going to try to hurt me. He's going to try to discourage me. He's going to try to convince me that I've lost it or that I don't deserve it. But it's a good thing that several years ago I figured out that the devil is a liar. And he couldn't tell the truth if he wanted to. He can't tell the truth. See, if he's really smart, he'd just tell me the truth. And then I'd believe the opposite. Because he's a liar. But he can't even do that. Jesus said, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. So every time he says you need to stop, that, that means I need to step on the pedal. You understand what I'm saying? Every time he says you need to, you need to slow down. No, that means we need, to, we need to put it in gear. Right? We need to stand up. We need to get after it. 
Because the devil's saying you need to stop. That means you're right there, man. You are right there. Every time he says, I better quit, I know I need to just keep pressing in. Every time he says, I'm not making a difference, oh, that makes me happy. Because that means that we're making a difference. That means people are coming out of darkness and into light. That means people are coming out of addiction into the freedom of God's Holy Spirit. That means that people are coming out of hell and gaining heaven. That means that we're making a difference. When the adversary says, you're not making a difference. Would you stand with us, please? What promises have you not yet stepped into? What mountain have you been rebuking? <laughs> when God's saying, that's not a mountain I want you to go around. That's ground I want you to take. What struggle is there in your life that you've you've just given up on? It? You see, there's a word from the Lord for you. You may not have it. That's the first thing you need to do is you need to find that word. Ask God to lead you to the word. And once you get that word, and it, and it may be as simple as the word that says in Romans 8, Yea, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. That's a word right there that you could grab a hold of and say, God, I'm more than a conqueror. I may not feel like it right now, look like it right now, or act like it right now. You said I'm more than a conqueror. Give me this mountain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know what God's going to lead you to do right now, but I want faith to rise up. I want faith to rise up. And I want you to try to identify that mountain, that mountain, that possession in your life. I want you to identify. It may be security of mind or peace. It may be joy that's left you. It, I don't know what it is, but I want you to identify it right now. And after you've identified it, as we praise the Lord for the next few minutes, I just want you to say to God, God, give me this mountain. Give me this mountain. I know this mountain comes with a fight. I know this mountain may be well fortified by the enemy because the enemy does not want me to possess it. But God, give me this mountain. I'm willing to take the steps. I'm willing to step out into what may seem like troubled waters what may seem like dangerous ground but I'm willing to step out knowing that I will not step out by myself and that you my God you will go before me you will be with me if you will go ahead and sing when you're ready and I want you to identify it because I'm going to be praying right now for faith to rise up in your heart and trust God everybody falls sometimes I gotta find strength to rise from the ashes and make a new beginning. Give me this Anyone can feel the ache. You think it's more than you can take, but you are stronger, stronger than you know. Don't give up now. The sun will still be shining. You gotta face the clouds. Find the silver lining. See, dreams will be mountain. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Give me this mountain, God. Give me this mountain. I've seen dreams that move the mountains. Hope that doesn't ever end. Yes, Even when the sky is full. Thank you for faith.
God. Hallelujah. Let faith arise. Let hope arise. Thank you, Lord. We trust you, Lord. We trust you, Jesus. We trust you. Impossible is not a word, it's just a reason for someone not to try. Everything's scared to death when they decide to take that step about on the water, and it'll be alright. Life is so much more. every heart and mind is upon the Lord right now. I know there's several needs because there were several hands that went up. But let's say a let's say a special prayer right now for Miss Doss. Uh, she had knee surgery a couple weeks ago and had to have it redone on Friday because of infection. And we're just gonna we're just gonna pray in Jesus' name that there will be no more infection. There will not have to be another redo. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I just pray right now in your precious name. I thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, let there be just a manifestation of your Holy Spirit, Lord, in her body. Thank you, Lord. No infection. No infection. Everything is set perfectly, Lord. Everything is healing up, God. Thank you, God. The healer, the healer, the healer is moving. Moving on her right now. 
Thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. All the other families that are represented here with needs, Lord, we recognize that you are our healer. Healing is not just something you do, it's who you are. So we thank you for healing. We thank you for praise reports. We thank you, God, for the mighty working of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you, God, for giving us this mountain. Thank you, God. Thank you for the word that we can hold on to and embrace. We give you praise. Come on, can you just praise the Lord? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Thank you for watching the Life Worship Center broadcast, 1604 Golden Springs Road. For more information about our church, visit us on the web at lifewc.org.